Hey everybody, this is Mr. Moppin coming at you with another A Push video. Uh, we are taking a look at topic 2.3, the regions of British colonies. Uh, in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the development of uh, Greater New England. Uh, yes, we are going to be taking a look at some issues that will be affecting, you know, for example, Massachusetts. But we're also going to be venturing out into the other neighboring colonies of that region, such as the formation of Rhode Island. Uh, Connecticut and New Hampshire. But uh, we are going to start off first in Massachusetts. Uh, once again, here is a quick reminder of the region. Uh, previously, we talked about Plymouth being the first permanent settlement for the British in for the, yeah, for the British in New England. And then 10 years later, Massachusetts Bay being formed, uh, centered right here in Boston. Both of these uh, settlements are going to be, you know, kind of the, the standard bearer for what is going to be, you know, the majority of these settlements in the region that is going to be, at least the majority initially, that is going to be centered in on very strict Calvinist, Puritan, uh, religious ideals that kind of define these communities. Um, now, that of course includes concepts such as predestination and having a covenant with God, you know, things like that. Uh, but as we go through the century, and, and remember, you know, we're, we're covering a long period of time in this unit. Uh, so remember, you know, things change over time. And one of those things that's going to be changing is uh, how religion is going to be viewed in this region. And you're going to start to see some folks that are going to be questioning some of the very, you know, devout uh, conservative ideals that had, you know, been the foundation for these settlements. And one of these people in particular that's going to have a very significant impact is this woman right here. This is Anne Hutchinson. Uh, Anne Hutchinson was an immigrant from England that uh, came over in the, uh, the 1630s. Uh, her and her 11 children, if you will. Um, and she is going to really kind of shake up the status quo. Uh, you know, she is going to be challenging a lot of the conventional wisdom in terms of theology in Massachusetts Bay. And of course, being a woman at that time, this is going to be seen as especially threatening because this is not just questioning the religious values of the community, but it's also questioning gender roles. The idea that a woman is going to be asserting these, you know, these, uh, you know, very extreme beliefs. Well, what are these beliefs? What is she going to be talking about? Well, uh, Ann Hutchinson is going to be uh, a supporter of this uh, antinomianism. Uh, uh, movement at the time. Uh, now, Anne's part in this is going to be centered in on the idea that in order to, uh, you know, be destined for heaven, if you will, remember the general assumptions that even though predestination existed, uh, you were always looking for signs of God's favor. And there was a general sense that if you showed the signs of God's favor, in this life, then you got a pretty good indication of where you're going to be in the afterlife. Uh, and Anne Hutchins is going to be rejecting a lot of that. Uh, she's going to be of the mindset that uh, you can have direct, uh, you know, uh, revelation from God. The idea being is that God can give you, uh, you know, what the answers to the Bible are, uh, which is going to be flying in the face of the conventional, you know, theology there, which was. Uh, the Bible is what it is. It says what it says. Uh, there's really nothing more to it. Whereas Anne Hutchinson says that, you know, hey, you know, God can speak to you directly and tell you what the Bible means, even if it's in conflict with what other people think. So there's this sense of, you know, hey, you can challenge the status quo and defy the rules of the, 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 the theocratic rules of the community. Well, community leaders in Massachusetts did not like it, and they especially did not like this coming from a woman. Uh, she is basically going basically to be viewed as, for lack of a better term, a heretic uh, in defying this. She's going to be accused of committing heresy. And uh, just a few years after landing in Massachusetts Bay, she and her family are going to be uh, summarily re kicked out of Massachusetts Bay. Uh, she will be in Rhode Island for a few years, but eventually she will make her way down towards uh, New Amsterdam, or at least outside of New Amsterdam in the Dutch area there, where unfortunately her and six of her children will be massacred as part of an Indian raid. Uh, but 
the impact of Anne Hutchinson is very, very significant because she is going to be not only defying religious norms at that time, she is going to be defying, or excuse me, defying gender norms. I mean, you can certainly, you know, point to her as an example of feminism, the idea that she is, you know, uh, refusing to accept what uh, men had told her uh, a woman's role is supposed to be. Uh, but it does also speak to the reality is that, you know, if you did not fit in with the rules of that community, the community really wasn't going to change. They were going to just kick you out of the community. Uh, and so the basic understanding was that in Massachusetts, you either followed the, you know, the religious dogma of that community or you are out of the community. And this is going to lead to the creation of some of these other neighboring colonies, starting with uh, Rhode Island. Uh, Rhode Island, as you can see here, is going to be to the southwest of Plymouth and uh, Boston. And Rhode Island is going to be founded by this individual right here, Roger Williams, who's going to have, for the time, an extremely liberal idea about uh, church and state uh, and tolerance in, in religion in New England. You know, we always talk about the uh, creation of Massachusetts by Puritans as created in, you know, under the guise of religious freedom. But hopefully we should know now that it really wasn't about religious freedom for everybody. It was just the freedom for them to practice their faith and only tolerate their faith. That is it. Williams had a much broader, more liberal idea of what religious toleration meant. And for him, that meant all Christians, that all Christians should be allowed to practice their faith freely without being worried about being, uh, you know, criminally punished or shunned by their neighbors or anything like that. Uh, and that's where Rhode Island is going to come from. Uh, it is going to be a very, very, you know, for the time and place and whatever, uh, a very liberal community. In fact, so liberal that they're not only going to be accepting of all Christians, but also Jews. I mean, this was, you know, very unusual for the time. You know, the idea being is that, you know, from, you know, European anti-Semitic beliefs that Jews were not entitled to having, you know, free and legal uh, religious freedom, that if you were going to be a Jew, for example, in parts of Europe, uh, at best you could practice it, but you'd have to pay a, a tax to be able to, you know, uh, you know uh, practice your faith. Uh, in Rhode Island, that's not going to be the case. So, you know, Rhode Island is certainly going to be a, an area of salvation for those that don't seem to fit in with everybody else religiously, to kind of be the misfits, if you will. Of course, the Puritans did not uh, look uh, look at this as uh, you look highly upon Rhode Island. They always, they called it the religious sewer of Rhode Island, uh, but it certainly is going to be in contrast to Massachusetts. Uh, looking to the west, you also had Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut is also going to be uh, created by those that are not going to quite fit in with the puritanical beliefs of Massachusetts, uh, and though it's not going to be quite as liberal as Rhode Island, the big thing we tend to talk about with regards to Connecticut is that Connecticut is going to be known for creating what many would argue uh, is the first English constitution in the Americas, known as the Fundamental Orders. Uh, now, what do we mean by this? Is that, well, you're going to see that, you know, in the Fundamental Orders, that it's actually a true, written-down framework for government that will actually blueprint all of the different uh, mechanisms of government. For example, the creation of a legislature, the creation of a governor. Uh, it details what the, the responsibilities of that legislature are, details the responsibility of what that governor is. Uh, it also includes, you know, limits on some of that power. You know, like, for example, how long someone can be governor, things like that. It also, uh, you know, puts in very black and white terms, uh, protection of suffrage rights. They said that every free man had the ability to vote for the members of the legislature. Uh, so, you know, this idea that you are crafting in writing and, 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 and you know, uh, creating this blueprint and framework for government that, in essence, rules that everybody is going to be uh, abiding by, this was, this was new. This was different. And you might be thinking, well, didn't England have something like that? And the answer is no. Uh, to this day, England does not have an actual written constitution. Uh, England's government is just the result of, you know, centuries upon centuries of tradition. Uh, but they didn't start out 
bang, here's a framework, and then built from there. Uh, so this idea of we're going to create a framework of government, then actually create the government, that was something new for the most part. Now, some argue the Mayflower Compact might be the first constitution. There's some legit arguments for that. That's more about the idea of the existence of certain parts of government and saying who can vote, not so much about the powers of government, the limitations of government, stuff like that. Uh, but because Connecticut claims the fundamental orders of the first constitution, that is why today Connecticut as a state is called the Constitution State. There you go. All right. Uh, now, looking up to the north, you also had uh, New Hampshire. New Hampshire is going to be coming along a little bit later compared to these others, you know, much later in the century. Uh, and New Hampshire is going to be a directly controlled um, royal colony, unlike what Massachusetts was early on or what Rhode Island was, you know, things like that. Uh, so, with that being said, uh, if we're looking at, you know, once again, a thing that's going to kind of, you know, bring together New England in many respects, it is the power of religion and, and one's view is on religion. Religion is going to be certainly defining what it means to be a New Englander. Uh, but as we go through the century, uh, we do find something very interesting happening. What had started out in the first generation or two of New England, particularly Massachusetts, a very intense religious fervor of the folks that were moving there, living there, raising their kids there, very strict rules, uh, and that includes strict rules on who would become members of the church. Uh, the members of the church were generally the elect, the, the folks that were viewed as the people that had God's favor, and part of that included some type of conversion experience, a covenant, if you will, with God. Um, for many people today, it would be kind of synonymous to a a sense of being born again in Christ, if you will. Uh, I know it's not one and the same, but, you know, close enough for what we're talking about here. But the idea is that you have had this connection with God that kind of, sh that, that kind of shows that you accept God's will and that God, you know, knows that you have accepted his will and that kind of stuff. Well, that's going to be important because that makes you an official member of the church. It allows you to have your, your, children uh, properly baptized in the community, all that kind of stuff. Well, as we go through the century, that's going to start to be on the decline. Uh, there's going to be fewer and fewer people that are going to claim that they had this conversion experience with God. Uh, you're going to be seeing uh, fewer people showing up for uh, services on the Sabbath. So there's kind of this concern amongst many of the church leaders that you know, we need to get people back into the church and feel like they have a connection with, with the church, therefore a real connection with God and the community. This is going to lead to what's called the halfway covenant, uh, which is basically going to stipulate that you are going to be able to have some type of membership privileges within the church. For example, being able to actually get your children baptized in the church uh, without necessarily having had a conversion experience with God. Uh, now, I know for many of you, this kind of seems like this is really getting kind of theologically, you know, highly technical. Uh, but the big gist of it is that what you're starting to see here, and what the Halfway Covenant is an example of, is that what you're starting to see here at this time is that we go from the first half of the century, once again, you know, kind of defined by people in Massachusetts with very, very, very profound, strong, conservative beliefs, uh, you know, pretty much immutable, you know, immovable. Uh, but as we go through the century, that's going to evolve. It's going to soften. Uh, and you know, as I have you know, mentioned previously, we're, it's kind of moving us closer to what's going to be in this congregational uh, church uh, that's going to be kind of, in essence, kind of a watered-down version of, of Puritanism over time. So anyhow, one of the themes you always want to be thinking about in history is how things continue over time, but also change over time, and religion is certainly one of those things for sure. All right, we'll see you next time.